Hello, everyone. This is going to be uh, uh, somewhat informal. Uh, um, I'm going to give you a, just three quick things, a little bit of synopsis of the Newcomer Kitchen program that uh, we, we founded uh, last year, a little bit of information about why money is both the most important and least important thing about the whole project, and a little bit about what I think is the important key innovation uh, here. So just a little by way of background, my name is uh, Len Senator. I run a small food venue in Toronto called The Depaneur. Uh, it's sort of unusual in that we invite different guest chefs to do different kinds of pop-up food events that change every week. Um, so in, uh, in this peculiar business that essentially invites total strangers to do all the cooking, last year when we first heard of the Syrian refugee families arriving in Toronto being housed in hotels uh, sometimes for weeks or even months at a time where they had no kitchens at all to cook for themselves or for their families, it wasn't that much of a stretch to just extend as a small gesture of hospitality an invitation to use our kitchen um, to make some familiar food, share a meal, bring some leftovers home for their friends, and uh, through a good fortune of meeting some really dynamic young uh, uh, refugees themselves who were bilingual and were able to facilitate on our behalf, we were able to bring in a cohort of ladies who had an amazing time, produced all this delicious food, and so we did it again, and we did it again after that. And from that small gesture of hospitality has emerged this really exciting new program uh, called Newcomer Kitchen. And so now the program works with over 60 families in the GTA, Every Thursday, a group of about six to eight of the women will come to the Depaneur. They prepare 50 meals of traditional Syrian home cooking. We sell those meals on our website for pickup. Fedora sponsors free delivery in the neighborhood and uh, flat rate delivery across the city. And then from all the revenue that's generated, we pay for the ingredients and then the money is distributed amongst the women who do the cooking. The program is put somewhere on the order of 70 to $75,000 directly into the pockets of these families in the last 16 months or so. Uh, that said, this, I think the, what's really exciting about this prototype uh, is, that, is not just what can happen in this space, but that it represents a model that could potentially work with any newcomer group in any kitchen willing to open its doors in any city in the world. And with that in mind, uh, we incorporated the Newcomer Kitchen as a non-for-profit organization last year in the hopes of securing funding to be able to create an actual playbook, a model that we could help propagate into communities where this idea is needed and could be valuable. Uh, and that uh, has proven to be very challenging and in a whole set of new ways. So I'm gonna, that's a little bit about what Newcomer Kitchen is and does and has done and continues to do. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why money is both important and not important to this project. Uh, it's first and foremost not a financial project or a job project in my opinion, it's a social program that uh, is an incredible opportunity at early intervention uh, the women who were involved in the products were still in the hotels. They didn't even have homes or addresses or you know, bank accounts or social insurance numbers to be able to come and begin to participate. For some of the women who came on those early days, this was their first foray into the city at all, the first time on public transit, the first time into downtown because of the, the draw of the kitchen and the community around it was so, so appealing from, as a break from the tedium of the hotels. Um, and what, what has emerged from that, the, the community, not only is it incredibly profound to have this amazingly diverse group of women all sitting around a table, sh finding common cultural experience and ground and sharing and making friends, there's an enormous amount of intra-cultural integration amongst the diverse groups within the community that happens as, as strong as the, as the intercultural integration between uh, the Syrian community and the Canadian community. This idea kind of flourished. It got an enormous amount of national and international attention. We were uh, um, we had the honor of a, of a visit from the Prime Minister. It was, it was in Time Magazine. It was in The Guardian. It was in uh, the American press, the Canadian press, worldwide. We've been getting calls from all over the world. But yes, yet we don't have the capacity all right, to take this idea out into the world. So money becomes an issue. We also have made the decision very early on to create a model that recognized the value of what these women actually knew and how to, and to provide a dignified wage for meaningful work. And I think the impact that that has had on their sense of optimism, on their sense of possibility in their new home has been profound and rippling out words throughout the whole community. And I think uh, it mount, m far outweighs the actual token amount of money involved. Um, I'll, I'll further add that um, beyond just the 
you know, the, on the, the, the language skills or the community building skills or the integration, the opportunity to, to give back, to do something that they're proud of and that they're good at and to feel validated and confident in their ability to contribute in a meaningful way. There are layers to this that are profound that keep me highly motivated in this project. This, uh, you know, this is a, connection, a direct connection to one of the oldest culinary traditions in the world. This is the foundational cuisine of the Western world. And uh, this knowledge is not owned by celebrity chefs and TV shows and fancy restaurants. It is owned by these women's and these mothers and these grandmothers who continue to make these recipes and argue whether you put cumin or you don't put cumin in any particular thing. But it is their, pa their patrimony, their uh, aggregate cultural wisdom, right, that uh, is incredibly profound. And what happens to all of this knowledge when six million people are thrown into global diaspora and they arrive in a place where, oh, no, no, you just buy that at the supermarket or we don't make that here or that's not, you know, why would you bother and just buy it? And, and so there's that incredible. There's in, uh, intergenerational, intercultural mentorship going on, the older women teaching the younger women how to cook. There's the sharing the, the women who don't have mothers to teach them those recipes anymore. So there's profound things going on. I'll furthermore add that one doesn't have the luxury of having a culinary tradition for 5,000 years if that tradition itself is not a technology for sustainability that teaches you what can you take from your environment, in what ratio can you take it, how often right, can you take it, in what season can you take it, so that you can continue to do it generation after generation after generation. We've been here, what, like 300 years? And we'll look what we've done to the place. I mean, there is something so profound to be offered here if we can shift this conversation from all the things we think that we need to teach them about what they need to know and find a way to open our minds and to listen and to perhaps see what we could learn and what they may have to teach us. We may actually get the most profound lesson of our lives at the last possible moment when we could have never needed it more than that said, I think I, I speak to this to say why the money, the, 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 the little bit of cash that we pay out every week is not the most important thing that we do. But it validates and it dignifies what we do. And from the perspective of the incredible women that we work with, it's incredibly important. There are a lot of programs out there, there are a lot of places that want to invite them to sit in a class and learn a thing this and take it. They want to earn some money to bring home to their family. It's not that complicated. They want that opportunity to feel useful, to make a meaningful contribution. And we have provided that. Uh, and the flip side is our ability to do so, right? This, we've created a program, a social program that earns back 50, 60, 70, 80% of what it costs to run. What pro social program does that? It's not only offering something of incredible value, it's offering it at an incredible value. And yet, despite the efforts of uh, the co-founders, of, of a dedicated team of volunteers, of all of, our, all of the support of people that we've met working in indus this industry, to date, the sum total of material support that we've been able to receive in an official capacity has been some bus tickets to reimburse the ladies at bus fare. And all other monies keeping this program alive have been entirely self-funded, uh, which has put an enormous uh, personal and uh, uh, drain, and, and, and it's, it's, it, I'd come at enormous personal cost to everyone involved, and because of the, the pr ongoing precarity of the situation and our desire to see it go out into the world and realize its true potential and our, our inability to rise to meet that challenge for lack of resources to do so. The last uh, part I'm going to mention here is, uh, before passing it to Kara, my, uh, the co-founder of the program, is uh, how I see this as a key uh, innovation. Uh, I think Canada's you know, uh, private sponsorship model represents a really profound innovation in the, the global sphere in terms of how we choose to respond to this global humanitarian crisis. It, uh, it unlocks the latent capacity of the private citizen to respond and engage and provide and contribute to the solution to, the, to this issue. And it, it's great in that first question of what do you do in the face of this global crisis. But there is a second question, which is, well, now they're here, so now what? And I do believe that Newcomer Kitchen represents one part of the answer to that second question. How do we unlock the latent capacity of small business right, to try to come in, this, in a similar way and address this second issue? And yet for the private sponsorships and all the sponsorship groups and everything's around, there is infrastructure in place to try to support them in their ability, but for projects like ours and in attempting to bring our innovation to the second question, we're really 
figuring it out on our own and we're really trying to, uh, I think there needs to be more support for this type of, uh, uh, if we're gonna take this private sponsorship model out into the world and promote it as a Canadian innovation, we need to have this corollary innovation to support it beyond that first year. Um, so I, uh, that's a very cons short uh, sort of summary of the things I wanted to share with you. I'm going to hand this now to Kara Benjamin Pace, who's been the co-founder, uh, the co-founder of the project, and now is the program director and leads all of the activities that Newcomer Kitchen does. Great. Well, thanks very much. Um, he's he's always a hard act to follow. So, um, but I'd like to thank everybody for inviting us here today and and allowing us to share our story with you. You know, we like to say that 18 months ago the ladies came into the Depener. And once they realized what was on offer, they threw off their coats and threw themselves into our lives. And for the last 18 months, I have lived and breathed this community every single day. And it is true that it has taken enormous amount and has changed my life, I know. Sometimes, you know, it's challenges, but it also has been incredibly rewarding. And one of the things that I have learned is, is that I have as much to learn from the community and the women I work with every day as they have to learn from me. And so, again, in terms of the model, we, we started off with a social enterprise, and the Depener is really an incubator. It's an accelerator for all sorts of entrepreneurs and for people who want to, you know, share their culinary traditions. Had it not been for a social enterprise uh, that Len Senator started seven years ago, there would be no Newcomer Kitchen because it was that kind of infrastructure that was there uh, that allowed something like Newcomer Kitchen to take seed and to have the support, whether it was the website or uh, the kitchen or the business structure or, in fact, Len's personal money that he invested in this in the first year of the project. It never would have happened. So, you know, there's a tremendous amount of goodwill out there in small business to, uh, we feel, support kind of innovative projects like this. As Len said, you know, we get many, many emails uh, across the world, but we get many restaurateurs within Toronto who want to participate in a project like this. And at the end of last year, when uh, the Honest Ed block on Markham Street was being torn down, a friend of ours had a restaurant, and uh, so we said to him, you know, you've only got a month or two left, would you like to do a pop-up? And we, uh, we embedded a, a Syrian brunch pop-up that was incredibly successful, and actually I think made it to the best brunch in Toronto and Savoir Magazine. And so, you know, one of the things that we are so passionate about is that we believe there's so much prosperity to unpack in this coming together of small business, uh, refugees, communities, and what we've found is a tremendous hunger in the corporate community to support us. So, um, you know, we have a lot of corporate co clients that uh, use our catering service because now we just don't do Thursdays or as the ladies call it, hamis, but we also do a lot of corporate catering. And in fact, our very first, our very first dinner was for Mayor John Tory on Canada Day and an iftar at uh, the home of Kristen Stewart. And uh, we had met him uh, on International Refugee Day uh, at, at City Hall, and lo and behold, we had an invitation a week later. And so, you know, nowhere to, nowhere, nowhere to start but the top. And uh, it was a phenomenal experience for the ladies because I remember so clearly after we had cooked for days and days and we all, you know, went down, you know, to this incredible home uh, downtown, a beautiful condo with a view over the city, and John Tory came in, uh, a man um, broke fast, and, you know, John Tory was so touched by what we were doing, and he said, this is exactly the sort of thing we need to happen in this city. And uh, we had a phenomenal party. Uh, Kirsten Sewitt said it was the best party she'd ever thrown. And then all of a sudden, I was gathering the ladies together, and, you know, it was their first Canada Day in the country, and they were away from their families. And I felt really badly about that, but I also knew that they were gaining something really invaluable. And I remember we were out in the patio and all of a sudden the fireworks started. And they knew that they had value in this country. And it's these kinds of experiences that we have every single day at Newcomer Kitchen, whether we get invited to terroir, you know, which is you know, the, the most prestigious North American culinary uh, symposium, 
or whether it's at the Luminata Food Festival, whether it's, uh, you know, whether we're, you know, catering for big con conferences, uh, or whether we're holding workshops in the Depeneur. In fact, today, uh, just today, we held a workshop for uh, 10 boys from Royal St. George, a private school here in Toronto. And, you know, one of our, our main coordinators, a marvelous woman, you know, she was the school teacher back in, in Damascus. And will she ever be a school teacher here in Canada? Probably not. But she held the most amazing workshop with a bunch of teenage boys, sharing her culture, allowing them to ask questions. You know, we talked to them about the sharing economy, and we talked about uh, social enterprise. And quite frankly, you know, when I was shocked, they had never heard of these things because they were living in a bubble. But we have found that through our workshops, we have all sorts of different communities that come and have that opportunity to, to simply, you know, learn recipes and share conversations and bake bread. And, and so we find that this is something that we, we really love to do, these, these workshops. But, you know, then in, in uh, October of uh, 2016, when we uh, decided that Although we were a fledgling social enterprise, we really wanted a little bit of government support just to, to get us moving. And uh, so we incorporated and we were so excited and we thought we joined this amazing new club called you know, the not-for-profit world. And, and what we discovered very quickly was, you know, yes, we had joined it, but there were, there were, there were gates and there were you know, many levels to that. To that to that participation and, and, and where we thought we could immediately start applying for government funding and foundation funding, all of a sudden we found there was nothing but barriers everywhere that we turned. And it's been quite an education. And I know that everybody in this room is in the same boat. You know, we're, we're all trying to find ways to, to utilize the funds that government has in the best way possible. And one of the things that I'm very encouraged about over the last year is that I see that the government is listening. And I see that they're really interested in innovation and partnership. Uh, I know I, just, uh, I was just opening up the new IRCC uh, grant that, that's called um, uh, service, um, uh, <coughs> Resettlement Services Delivery Improvement. And that, indeed, they're looking for partnerships with business. And they're looking for new models. Uh, pay for performance models, and I think this is really important because it's 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 not just about um, it's not just about teaching them and delivering them services. It's about engaging them to participate in the economy, and we can do this at this kind of hybrid level in which we, if you know, with hopefully government support in the near future, uh, we can start to really uh, engage the many, many women that want to participate in the project. We have 60 women. We, we have waiting lists of women that want to. And, you know, even the settlement agencies, you know, say to us, you know, we can spot a newcomer kitchen woman the minute she walks in the door. She walks with confidence. She, she has a grasp of, you know, a very strong grasp of English because, of course, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, English... Uh, on-the-job training that, you know, goes on in, in a casual and sometimes, you know, formal manner in what, in what we do. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, I just wanted to, to, to give a shout-out to Deloitte because a year ago, uh, almost today, they came to, uh, to us on Impact Day, which is a day that across the country the, the employees give back. And, and they'd heard about our project, and they, and they came and, and they said, what can we do? And we said, well, we need the garden cleaned up, and I need to turn my... Uh, dirty laundry closet into my office because I don't have anywhere to do all the paperwork for Newcomer Kitchen. And, and we also like to, you know, pick the brains of the best and brightest in your organization. And 15 people came and they spent the day with us. And since that time, we've, you know, developed a very uh, remarkable relationship with Deloitte. And so not only are, are they our clients, and we actually go and cater downtown in the corporate headquarters there uh, once a month, but they are now our advisors. They're, they're developing a strategic plan for us with their advising community together program called ACT. And they only choose about 10 to 15 projects across Canada a year that they feel have real capacity for social change. And uh, Len and I were there a couple of nights ago and uh, not only you know, are they deeply passionate about what we're doing, but the next step is uh, 
the, uh, the ladies themselves are going to go down to Deloitte's headquarters and sit around the boardroom table and participate in the design of the next level of where we want to go because we think the most important thing now is, is that we definitely feel that these women have an enormous capacity and they have a voice and they have opinions and they, they want entrepreneurship and they want employment and, and it's our job to listen and it's our job to facilitate. And we really hope that going forward with you know, a little bit of partnership with perhaps even some of the organizations here in the room today that we can continue to do what it is that, that we love to do and, and um, yeah. Thank you.